So tonight we're like, very lucky to have one of our MOCA distinguished visitors giving the public talk, Professor Christian Iliadis. Uh, Christian's a professor of physics and astronomy um, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the US. Uh, and he's a nuclear astrophysicist at the Triangle University's Nuclear Laboratory. He was born in Germany and received his diploma in physics at the University of Munster. He then moved to the, to the United States where he worked on his PhD thesis at the uh, University of Notre Dame. And after a three-year postdoc fellowship in Vancouver at Triumph, uh, which houses uh, the largest nuclear physics facility in Canada, um, <coughs> it accepted a faculty position at the University of North Carolina, which is where he is now. He's been a full professor since 2006 and is an author of the textbook, Nuclear Physics of Stars. Uh, he's also an award-winning teacher, highly valued by stu students. I did a Google and uh, noticed that on the website, uh, <laughs> RateMyProfessor.com. <laughs> His students have <laughs> rated him 96%, uh, which is pretty. So he's, he's also a good teacher as well as scientist. Uh, Christian visits uh, astrophysics group here at Monash every year or two. He also has family connections in Melbourne through his Greek heritage. In, in his talk tonight, Christian will take us on a journey explaining what we know about, <coughs> about the stuff that we and everything else around us is made of, the chemical elements. Please welcome Professor Christian Iliadis. Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Okay. So, ah, Simon, we have a minor problem here. This is not my desktop, neither on the left nor on the right. Ah, we skip the talk. We just <laughs> talk about other things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. This is very exciting to be back in uh, Australia, Melbourne, and Monash University. So I'm on a mission today to explain to you where the elements are coming from. And many of you, of course, know where they're coming from. But uh, some really important issues you may not have heard about. So this is the message I want to get across. If you have any questions, please ask me. And um, yeah, so let's start. OK. So on the add to this presentation, there was a trivia question. So I have a prize to hand out today. I'm really proud of that. I spent half a day yesterday to, to buy this prize. And um, here's the question. So what you see here is a supernova explosion. This is Tycho supernova. This is um, the first thermonuclear bomb detonation, the so-called mic shot. And this is my mobile phone here. And the question was, which physics effect is crucial for all three phenomena shown below? Aha, that gentleman here. What's the thing of two things? Electromagnetic radiation and quantum tunneling? Ah, I have to say. And of course, a soccer ball, because Australia won a major soccer championship, a tournament. Amazing. Are you sure? Yeah. I don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> Wonderful job. This spoils the talk a little bit, because I have more <laughs> trivia questions, because I thought nobody would know this. But this is wonderful. OK, let's go on. Um, so, oops, let's talk about elements. What are elements? And um, the first person who really put some order in all these elements and had different colors and different properties was um, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev. And here you see handwritten his, uh, the, the first arrangement of the elements here. And in an interview, he said that, I saw in a dream a table where all elements fell into place as required awakening. I immediately wrote it down on a piece of paper. Only in one place did the correction later seem necessary. So what we mean by periodic table is you have all these elements, and you want to order them according to some more underlying fundamental principle. 
So the modern incarnation of a periodic table is shown here. Most of you have seen this. So let's have a closer look. So you have hydrogen here, then helium is placed over there, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and so on. Do you see this number here, one, and the two, and then lithium has a three and a four. What does that mean? What do these numbers mean? How, how are these elements ordered? Ah, the num sorry? Ah, very good. So these numbers signify the number of protons in the atomic nucleus. So let's talk a little bit about um, some abundances. Yeah, I will show you pie charts. We all love pie charts. This one is crystal clear. Sometimes we don't know, but this one here. So pie charts. Ah. Trivia question number two. What is the third most abundant element in the universe? There are all these uh, astronomers in this audience here. Very good. So oxygen. So the abundance in the universe, this is how the distribution looks like. It's mostly hydrogen and then helium. And the third most abundant element in the universe is oxygen. And everything else just in here in this thin slice. It's amazing if you think about it. So mostly the universe consists of hydrogen and helium. Well, what about the Earth's crust? Here things look different, but again, oxygen is the largest percentage here. Then you have silicon, aluminum, iron, and then calcium, and so on. What about the elements that make up life? So our cells, DNA, and so on. In life, you have mostly oxygen. Then there's carbon, hydrogen, bound as H2O, water, and then there's nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, and so on. Okay, we would like to know what this talk is about. Where are these elements really coming from? Okay, so as we said earlier, the, elemental, the element identity is determined by the number of protons. And then, of course, any piece of matter is neutral, so the number of protons got to be, for the neutral atom, got to be equal to the number of electrons. So, atomic structure. Yesterday I was in Fitzroy and I walked by a coffee shop and I saw a logo that looked very, very similar to this one here. This is a crude atomic model if you think about it. I love really good coffee. So here, doesn't tell us how the nucleus looks like, but that's good enough for me. There's coffee there. And then you have these things here. Who can guess what kind of atom this is? Oh, you're close. You're really... No, you're not close. Sorry. Sorry. Lithium. Very good, because three protons. What is lithium mostly used for? Well, of course, lithium batteries, but also thermonuclear bombs. Okay? Next one here. This is very interesting. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, this is the agency that promotes the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And it shows, oh, this is interesting. There's the nucleus here, and you have slightly more realistic, not these very symmetric electron orbits, but who knows what this atom would be? Very good. Do you know what beryllium is mostly used for? Ah. This is very interesting, too. It's mostly used <laughs> by the military and for nuclear bombs. And I find this very ironic that beryllium, you know, used for military applications. And there is the peaceful organization there. So I went to a chemistry textbook, and I found this amazing sketch. And this is pretty much what we all have in our heads, OK? We have, there's the nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons. And there are the electrons here. Protons shown in blue, neutrons shown in red, so we can count the number of electrons. We have six. You can count the number of protons, six, and this would be carbon. Very good. This is carbon, and there's a number of things that are fundamentally wrong with these sketches that we all have in, have in our heads. So let's talk about this one. What's wrong with these sketches? Trivia question number three. So the gentleman who won the soccer ball that I spent half a day yesterday to hunt down in Saudi Arabia. Can you hold that up, please? 
So the question is the following. If a so, so atoms are very small, let's, let's think about, let's think about a model of an atom. If a soccer ball, which has a radius of 11 centimeters, is our model for the atomic nucleus, then how far away from the center do the electrons move? Soccer field? Who said, who said 10 kilometers? This is where my apartment is in South Yara, and you're absolutely right. Very good. So think about it. This soccer ball, so the scales are vastly wrong. The electrons move 11 kilometers away. That's Saudi Arabia. The other thing that's vastly wrong, and most of you will know this, is there are no planetary, there are no electron orbits that look like planetary orbits. So well, how should we visualize atoms then? Quantum mechanics tells us that there are no orbits. All there is is a probability to find the electron at a certain position. So if you just take a snapshot of the electron position, you obtain one dot in the sketch. Another snapshot, you obtain another dot. If you take 10,000 snapshots, you obtain something that we call an electron cloud, okay? That's the picture you should have in your mind. Uh, for all these trivia questions, I'm already exhausted here. Come in. So this one is interesting. Okay, we said that I hope you're convinced atoms consist most, mostly of empty space, right? The electron is a South Yara. And so my hand consists of atoms, so this is empty space, and this wall here consists of atoms, this is empty space. Why can't I move my hand through this wall? Very good. Electron repulsion, meaning that I have an electron cloud from all these atoms on the surface of my hand. The same thing happens here on the wall, and like charges repel each other, and that's the reason why I cannot move my hand through the wall. So there is a, we call it an energy barrier that prevents us from doing that. Okay, there's an energy barrier. All right? So next, let's talk about stars now after these introductory remarks. Um, so people wanted to know, where's the energy coming from that powers the sun, that keeps us alive? And this was, uh, the arguments went back and forth. And finally, in the 30s, people had it figured out. It got to be nuclear energy, not atomic energy. This has nothing to do with the electrons, so nuclear energy. We'll talk about this in a minute. And the first people who really understood this was Hans Bethe and his graduate student, Charles Critchfield. And all this happened in, in papers written at the end of the 30s, before World War II, and independently, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker, who came up with these sequences of nuclear reactions that take place in the, in the sun. So from now on, we will only talk about the atomic nuclei, not the electrons anymore. They're irrelevant for us. So if you think about it, stars, the universe, we said, consists mostly of hydrogen and helium. So then you may think, okay, hydrogen fuses to helium, and that's happening. But how is this happening? So you take four protons, and they fuse together, and there's helium. Sometimes you find this picture in a textbook oh, completely wrong, because people originally calculate the prob what's the probability of finding two protons at the same spot for fusion. That's already small. Then add, multiply this by another probability that there's a third proton, times another probability, too small probably. This, this never happens. And now, of course, you have four protons. And here, helium consists of two protons and two neutrons. That something, something is not right. So what um, Beate Critchfield and Weizsäcker really came up with is a three reactions in a, s in a sequence. So this is now called the PP chains. And I would like to show you these PP chains. So this is how fusion in the sun starts and of course in many other stars, you have two protons shown in red, and they come together, they fuse, and what's moving away is again hydrogen, it has one proton, but it also has one neutron. So this is heavy hydrogen, deuterium, moves away. So this is the first step. You went from two protons to one deuterium nucleus. In the next step, this deuterium nucleus moves around, ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what is moving away here? OK, now this is we're completely confused. 
What is moving away here is, if you think about details, charge needs to be conserved. So one of these things moving away after the nuclear reaction is a positively charged electron. We call it a positron. And then angular momentum needs to be conserved. So the other thing that moves away is a neutrino. Second step, the deuterium moves around in the plasma, finds another proton and fuses and produces a variety of helium. This is not the ordinary helium-4, but another um, isotope of helium. It has just one neutron, but two protons here. And what moves away is a photon. Really, any time in, in physics, when you put a system together from different pieces, you have excess energy. And the system tries to get rid of the excess energy. And in this case, it does it by emission of a photon. And the final step, Two of these helium-3 nuclei in the plasma, they move around and they fuse together. And now the system has so much energy, it only can get rid of it by emission of two protons. So this is the simplest case by which stars can produce energy. And you see that's already complicated. It's the three steps here and... Okay, so... Now, let's talk about some principles. It's easy to show you these little uh, movies, but that doesn't really tell you what's happening and on what the physics behind all this is. So let's look at another type of phenomenon that involves nuclear reactions. This is uh, a video of the Tsar Bomba that the Soviets exploded in 1961. It was one of the very largest thermonuclear bomb detonations ever undertaken. It looks pretty scary. If you look at this, yeah, sure. <laughs> so you ask yourself, where is that energy coming from? So this is a nuclear energy, but well, how exactly is this happening? The answer to that question is provided by Einstein's famous equation, E is equal mc squared, very famous equation, one of the most famous equations in physics. And um, sometimes when this is introduced in class, my students think, oh, oh okay, this is what this equation means. Uh, if I have a mass and the object moves with a speed of c, then this is, no, no. This is no material object can move with a, sp with a speed of c. What this equation means is c is a universal constant. It's the same everywhere in the universe. It means that if there's any piece of matter lying on the desk in front of you, then you multiply the mass of that object by the speed of light with it, which is a huge number, but squared, which makes it an even larger number, and that's the amount of energy stored in that piece of matter. That's what this equation means. So, let's use this equation. I try to keep equations at a minimum, but this is relatively simple. So we turn this around. We want to know how much mass was converted to energy in this gigantic explosion, well, we solve this for m. m is equal energy divided by c squared. 50 megatons, that's million tons of TNT is the, the conventional e chemical explosives. Think about it, 50 million tons of chemical explosive divided by c squared. That gives 2.5 kilogram, which is the mass of my laptop there. That is the energy that was converted the mass that was converted in this gigantic explosion. So in the sun, in principle, something very similar is happening, but the reaction, the nuclear reactions are different. So for the sun, we said we have fusion of four protons to one helium, four nucleus. It turns out, interestingly, this is why this only can work, if you sum the mass of four hydrogen atoms, then the weight is larger than the weight of a single helium. Nucleus. So this means there is a mass difference. It's 0.7%, very small, but remember you multiply this by C squared and that accounts for the energy production of the sun. The sun converts each second 4 million tons of mass to energy. Okay, so who measured the first nuclear reaction? This was New Zealand-born Ernest Rutherford who obtained a Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1908, he was the discoverer of many things, uh, mostly famous for discovery of alpha radioactivity. But several years later, he discovered the first nuclear transmutation. He was experimenting with these 
alpha particles that were emitted by radioactive substances, radium and so on, and he directed those alpha particles on, on a piece of matter, on other elements, and then he, what he just thought he discovered is that the alpha particles, so this is helium here, react with nitrogen and create something completely different, carbon and proton. Think about this is an alchemist's dream. You cannot do this in chemistry. You put two things together and you create a new element. Absolutely amazing. It turns out that this was incorrect. He did discover the first nuclear transmutation, but that was not the correct one. And in those days, the detectors were very crude. They used scintillators. I mean, there's a flash of light. Anything can cause the flash of light. Patrick Blackett got the Nobel Prize in 1948 for his development of the Wilson cloud chamber. And the cloud chamber essentially is a supersaturated liquid and anything that distorts and leaves energy in the liquid that uh, gives rise to bubble creation. So if you have ionizing radiation, like an alpha particle or something similar, that leaves energy in the bubble chamber, you can see the track of the elementary particles. Crude detectors, but brilliant. I mean, it's, this was in 1925 and really, these type of detectors give you already most of the information what you want to, uh, that you need to know. This is a cloud chamber photograph of what's really happening. Look at this alpha particle here. It goes straight through. It doesn't undergo any reaction. The alpha particle loses energy and leaves this, this track in the cloud chamber. Similar here, alpha particles, nothing is happening. They, all they do is they move through the saturated liquid and they lose energy. Look at this one, the alpha particle here. Now something is happening. According to Rutherford, if this would be the correct reaction, there should be three things moving away from the reaction point here, the vertex, but there are only two things moving away. So Blackett could establish that really helium fuses with nitrogen and that produces two things, protons or hydrogen and oxygen. If you look very closely here, you can see that the oxygen created scatters, doesn't go undergo a reaction because there's no other um, particle moving away. It's just deflected because it's now scattered by other nitrogen nuclei. So that was the first nuclear reaction. I have only one or two slides about my research because I really want to make the point today, synthesis of the elements. I don't want to get lost in my research details here. But this is where I'm coming from. Last week I was, so there's New York, Washington, North Carolina's right here, and we are right in the middle there, very close to where the fly moves, right there in the middle. And we have a laboratory called Laboratory for Experimental Nuclear Astrophysics. And um, what is special about this laboratory, it produces the highest proton beam intensity in the world. So Rutherford had alpha particles incident on a piece of metal to study uh, nuclear reactions but we want to measure fusion reactions that occur in stars. So we need to be able to dial in the energy. The alpha particles emitted from radioactive material have discrete energies. That's not good enough for us. So we need to use ion accelerators. Here's the floor plan of our laboratory, two ion accelerators and then ion beams, they move in here and then the fusion reactions occur there. So you want to study, say, the fusion of hydrogen with oxygen. How do you do this? Well, oxygen you put here at the end. But now you need to somehow have hydrogen and give that hydrogen enough kinetic energy so that a nuclear reaction can be initiated. So we feed hydrogen gas into an ion source. The ion source ionizes the hydrogen, removes an electron. Now you have a charged proton. You apply a voltage and you accelerate this proton. This is how you produce, in simple words, an ion beam. And now you need to transport this ion beam. You need to deflect it and steer it magnetically and electrically by these quadrupoles and steerers onto the target. And then you hope that nuclear reactions, you can measure nuclear reactions here. This is a little movie. I will show you a movie where we move from here. This is the view of this little accelerator here that is unique in the world. And we go around this way. I love movie making. I don't know anything about it, but. So if you feel nauseous at any time, because I'm not an expert, just close your eyes. So, wow, it's not that bad. So we move around here. If we would have sound, it would be really loud because these beam lines are all under vacuum. 
there must be. The ion beams, in this case a proton, must move in vacuum. Otherwise, you cannot transport this beam with good quality onto the target here. We have no operators in the laboratory, so our students, they become experts in vacuum technology, they become experts in high voltage systems, they become experts in electronic signal processing, radiation detectors. When they finish, their CVs look pretty impressive. So now we're around this band here, the second accelerator. We use this mainly for calibration purposes. Here you see the beam line, the steerers, some electronics. Some shielding here. There's our detector. Now, watch out. Something amazing will happen. Oops, my thumb. Sorry about this one. Right there. And there's the electronics. This is the radiation detector. What does that mean? We don't have cloud chambers anymore. We have more sophisticated detectors. So, remember, Rutherford measured the fusion of nitrogen and helium, which creates oxygen and hydrogen. So, it turned out for one of my PhD students who graduated very recently, we needed to measure the reverse of this reaction. That means we had oxygen incident, sorry, protons incident on oxygen, and we measured this reaction where we create alpha particles and nitrogen. But there's another reaction channel that competes with this one, and that is the fusion of these two nuclei to fluorine and a gamma ray. So here, this is the, the end part of the beam line. The proton beam is incident. The oxygen target is located right here. And then you have a gamma ray coming out, and then you detect this gamma ray with this very fancy detector. This detector, a hyperpure germanium detector, costs as much as my house. So you're really careful when you handle that thing there. So this paper was just published last week. Um, let's have a look. Interesting. This student, poor Matt Buckner here, he measured for months and months and months. I mean, it is difficult to perform these measurements at stellar energies. In total, he observed 33,000 reactions. But I told you, we produce the highest beam intensities in the world for these kind of measurements, we had six times 10 to the 20 incident protons. You divide, I mean, think about it. You divide these two numbers, then you obtain a number, well, I wrote it out here, there's a 5-5 five five and there's 17 zeros. It's so, the yield is so small, that's why these reactions are so challenging to measure. Why is the yield so small? Okay, this is now, the difficult part, aspect of the talk. Um, this is the tunnel effect, for me, is the most stunning science effect. So what you have here is a proton, say, and some other nucleus here, but these are charged. And remember the example with my hand and the wall, there was an energy barrier that prevents my hand to go through the wall. You have exactly a similar energy barrier for the nuclear fusion of two like charged nuclei to something else. They don't like to fuse. They like to repel each other. So common sense tells us that two charged nuclei repel each other instead of fusing together. So common sense, I put this little uh, cartoon together here. So you have an incident proton, and in order for fusion to occur, this proton must overcome this energy barrier, shown as a little wall here, and make it onto the other side so it can fuse with this nucleus. In classical terms, this will never happen because this proton doesn't have enough energy. It will be deflected, reflected at this point. It will move back from right to left and with 100% probability. There's just no other way. What is really happening in quantum mechanics is quantum tunneling. So there is a small chance that this proton, although it does not have the energy to overcome the barrier, will tunnel through the barrier, and then it's on the right-hand side, can fuse with the other nucleus. Small chance, the issue with all effects related to, the, to quantum mechanical tunneling is that this chance of tunneling, the precise number, depends crucially on the properties of this energy barrier. In simple words, 
If we make this barrier just a little bit thinner, it changes the probability for tunneling drastically, exponentially. And this is very important for technological applications of this tunnel effect. The tunnel effect was predicted by Friedrich Hund, but the first person who really applied it to a quantum mechanical problem, to alpha radioactivity, was George Gamow. At this stage, first year students at my university would say, yeah, right, quantum mechanical tunneling, dream on. And then I sort of tried to point out that there are many technological applications of quantum tunneling. Izaki, Gaver, and Josephson obtained the Nobel Prize in 1973 for quantum tunneling in superconductors. Then there were more Nobel Prizes, Rohra, Binich, Ruska, in 1986. When I was in high school, around 1980, my high school physics teacher told us, we'll never be able to image single atoms. This is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. So obviously, he really did not keep up with the literature because these gentlemen here, they were already working on this, and they obtained a Nobel Prize just a few. So they built this device, a scanning tunneling microscope, and I'm sure many of you have seen many of these quantum coral images. What this shows, for example, here, these are, each of these peaks is an atom. With this device, we can image single atoms. So this shows, interestingly, 48 iron atoms on the surface here, and then you can even study complicated quantum effects. In this case, you have the two-dimensional standing wave of the electron gas that is scattered between these atoms. Absolutely incredible. Students are usually eh, half convinced at this point. Now, my vote for the next Nobel Prize, my personal vote, goes to Fujio Masuoka, who is the inventor of flash memory. Flash memory. Well, let's have a look at this pie chart. Very interesting. This is the annual revenue, 2013, and now the numbers are going through the roof, but this was 2013, the best I could find, of flash memory. This B means billion, 30 billion US dollars, which is an enormous number. Where's flash memory used? Well, in USB sticks. My laptop here is a very old laptop. It's four years old. It has a magnetic hard drive, something that spins, very heavy. And when I return, the university has just ordered me a new laptop, and there's nothing spinning in there. It has flash memory in there. The largest market share, however, are smartphones. So what does that have to do with quantum mechanical tunneling? Tunneling is crucial for flash memory to work. In very simple terms, on a chip, if you want to store information without an external power source, that's what flash memory does, you need to be able to set bits, zero and one. That's all you need to set. So one that can be 60 electrons in some region inside a chip. And a zero can be zero electrons. So in flash memory, you have these regions inside an insulator. They're called floating gates. And you can put electrons into the region or extract electrons from the region. And the key is that if you get electrons in there, you extract them out, that the electrons must tunnel through an energy barrier. So again, quantum tunneling happens <coughs> in your pockets. It's not something esoterical. OK, so now a big leap forward. All I wanted to show you really is what's happening inside the sun, the PP chain, the simplest reaction chain. If you go to other stars, more massive stars than the nuclear reactions that take place, there are many, many different nuclear reactions. And it's very complicated. These massive stars go through many different stages of evolution. And so a massive star, at the end of its life, will have this, we call this an onion shell structure. You have iron here in the middle, then silicon, sulfur, oxygen, magnesium, oxygen and carbon, and so on. All of this was created by fusion reactions. Now, this star will explode as a supernova, and all this material will be ejected into space. It will enrich the interstellar matter. <coughs> so, not only are these elements ejected, but also 
the explosion itself makes new elements and of course are also ejected and that contributes to the enrichment of the interstellar medium. This is of course a very famous, the Crab Nebula. This remnant, the supernova was observed by Chinese astronomers on July 4, 1054. You see this beautiful image which is also shown here. And um, in green here, this is the emission from hydrogen emitted, ejected by the supernova. In the middle you have a millisecond pulsar, a neutron star of dimension of 10, 15 kilometers that spins, say, 30 times each second. Absolutely incredible. Um, not all stars will explode as supernovae. That depends strongly on the mass. Low mass stars, like the sun, will not explode as a supernova. They will become something we call asymptotic giant branch stars. And here's an example, TT Cygni, which is a carbon star about 1,500 light years away in the constellation Cygnus. What you have here, this is very complicated to explain in little words, but at this end stage of the evolution of low mass stars, complicated things happen in the interior. You have different burning shells that produce energy alternating and to make a long story short, these stars emit very strong winds. So they emit, they eject matter into the interstellar medium, not by an explosion, but by very strong stellar winds. By the way, this ring here, this is a millimeter radio wave image, and this shows the carbon oxygen molecule in this beautifully symmetric sphere. So, by the way, the local group here, they're world experts on massive stars and AGB stars. So this is John Latanzio, who's not here, Alex Heger, who's in the audience, Simon Campbell, my host. These are world experts on these, on these stellar models, computer models to understand these kind of events. So, just to summarize things, what's happening, this is a little simulation by a research group uh, in the UK. So the simulation shows you how, how stars form. You start with, in the simulation, with a thousand solar mass cloud of hydrogen, okay? And then you let the simulation go. You have turbulences, very complicated things happening. At some locations, the gas slows down so that gravity can pull in the gas and pulls it in and in and up to the point the temperature will increase in this region and up to the point where nuclear reactions start to occur and then we call this region a star. Okay, this is how stars are born. These little white things that are emitted, these are stars that have been born from this gas cloud that didn't have any stars before. And now you can see, of course, there's gravity going on, there's a dance of stars, some are being ejected out of this cloud and this is an example of a stellar nursery. In each of these stars, each of these white dots that you see, nuclear reactions occur. This is the only reason why we can see the stars. This is how they produce energy. And by doing that, by undergoing nuclear reactions, they also form new elements as we discussed. Okay, so each star synthesizes new elements via nuclear fusion and enriches the interstellar medium. And out of this material, new stars are born. And of course, they're produced from the ashes of stars of a previous generation. Let's have a very simple calculation here. So the age of the universe, 14 billion years. The age of the Earth is 4.5 billion years. So meaning the solar system was born from mater material that took part in this cycling of material for about 10 billion years, okay? Now, the typical age of a 10 solar mass star, just roughly, just to make things simple, is 10 million years. If you divide 10 billion by 10 million years, there's a factor of 1,000. So in other words, we went 1,000 times in this cycle 
before the solar system formed. Okay, this is the matter we consist of. All right, a little bit of history. What this shows here is we talked about elements, this is the elemental number on the x-axis, and the relative abundance on the y-axis on the logarithmic scale, and that squishes things together. There's hydrogen, helium, the most abundant elements in the universe, and then there's beryllium, lithium, boron. Look at this huge drop. Then we go up again, and there's oxygen, the third most abundant element, carbon, the fourth most abundant element, and then you see this interesting structure here, and if you look at the details, this is for elements. If you look at the abundance distribution of isotopes, this is even more interesting. The first people who really understood where these structures came from and assigned them to different stars or different sites in stars were Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle. The Burbages were astronomers. Fowler was a nuclear experimentalist. Hoyle was a theoretical astrophysicist. For this work, one of the highly cited papers in, in, in uh, astrophysics. Um, for this work, Fowler obtained the Nobel Prize in 1983. Okay, now, this is the periodic system, and I will tell you now, I will summarize after decades of research. So I went through the literature and tried to compile as much information as I could where the elements are coming from. So, first thing you can do is, you can draw this imaginary line here, the red line. Everything above this line is made by charged particle reactions, what we discussed in this presentation here. If you go below this red line, then there's just too much repulsion. You cannot form these, these elements by charged particle reactions. They're formed by neutron capture. So some of these stars release a lot of neutrons from nuclear reactions, and these neutrons then can be added much more easily to other nuclei to build up heavier elements. Why is this? Because neutrons are not charged. There's no repulsion there, okay? Okay, let's start with um, hydrogen, helium. They're not made in stars and part of lithium. They're made in the Big Bang. And this is pretty much all that's made in the Big Bang. Without stars, the universe would be a really boring place. Beryllium and boron are not made in stars either. They are made by um, cosmic ray spallation, so ultra-relativistic cosmic rays move through the interstellar medium, and through spallation reactions, they produce boron and beryllium. Everything else is made in stars. So let's see the colors, how the colors come out. Orange. So I'm only labeling one just to give you the color code here. So everything in orange is made in massive stars before the actual explosion. So you have oxygen, noble gas neon, you have aluminum, phosphorus, magnesium. All this is made mainly in massive stars before the explosion. Everything in red is made during the explosion of a massive star. So that includes calcium in our bones, titanium, half of iron. There's nickel here. Next, these iron-like elements, vanadium, chromium, manganese, and iron, I didn't talk about this at all. This, they're made in uh, type 1a supernovae. So half of all iron are made in type 1a, so type 1, type 2. They're completely different things. So type 1a supernovae, they're not massive star explosions, but this is an explosion in a binary star system. Okay. Then we go on. Everything in light blue and dark blue is made in asymptotic giant branch stars, so half of carbon, half of nitrogen, and things like barium, tin, lead, and in green, remember these dark blue ones, they're made by neutron capture. And of course the green ones, are also made by neutron capture, they're made in a process called the R process. The R process we are pretty successful in characterizing this process, so meaning we have a rough idea on the conditions, temperature, density, but we don't know the site yet. And the two favorite sites, I mean, I have people, many groups are doing research on this, the favorite sites are 
either a massive star explosion, so type 2 supernova, in the very deep layers during the explosion, or something completely different, the collision of two neutron stars. So this is pretty much gives you an overview of where the elements are made. And you see a few white spots. I mean, I tried to put some color here to lithium and fluorine, but really this is an open question. This is controversial. We don't really know where these elements are made. They're made, lithium is made partially in the Big Bang and cosmic ray spallation, but we know that there must be another stellar source. We don't know exactly what the source is. Fluorine, people think maybe AGB stars and massive stars, but there may be another source, maybe neutrinos. Technetium, well, is uh, radioactive. It has decayed away, even if it was there in the beginning of uh, when the solar system formed. Same thing with Promet Promethium. Polonium, radon, francium, radium, of course, they're present on Earth, but they were not made back then when the solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago, but they're part of the uranium and thorium decay chains. Uranium is made, by the way, silver, gold, and ura uranium are made in this R process. Uranium decays, the alpha emission produces a new element. The daughter element is not stable. It decays in turn. So you end up with decay chains. And part of these decay chains are polonium, radon, francium, radium. And everything beyond uranium here is man-made. Two elements, Einsteinium and fermium, were first discovered in nuclear weapons detonations. All right, in life. I showed you this pie chart before. So the oxygen and the phosphorus is produced before the explosion in massive stars. Then we have carbon and nitrogen. Half of this is produced in massive stars before the explosion. The other half in AGB stars. We got hydrogen, which is not produced in stars, produced in the Big Bang. And we got calcium, which is produced during the explosion. So this is pretty much where the elements come from that life consists of. Okay, I'm coming to the end here. This is a very interesting cartoon I found right there. Do you see it? Oh my God, I can't believe it. There's a smiley face. Let's have a look. What is a smiley face? This is Rutherfordium. Let's go back. Rutherfordium. Rutherfordium is here. So what they wiped out and put the smiley face on is dubnium, an element that was discovered at the end of the 60s in Russia in a famous laboratory at Dubna. Well, this was really a pleasure and I'm really honored to be here and thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Christian. Great talk. Um, so if we've got about 10 minutes for some questions. Um, we've got Damien over there with a the microphone. He's gonna run up on this side and I'll run up and bring the microphone to you. Any questions on this side? Any questions? I was just wondering, what's the rarest element and are there elements that we don't actually have that are just theoretical? The rarest element, the rarest element, I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest. I don't want to dream up something. The rarest element. Is it? Yeah. But of course, yeah, you've heard of you know, the second part of your question, the quest for super heavy nuclei and the island of stability and People are trying to find this. And there are all sorts of ideas out there on how to do this. I ran across a very interesting paper. I was not aware of this work at all, where there are a number, about 15 atomic bomb explosions in the 60s. Their partial aim was to look for new elements and to go to these super heavies. And um, this was in the 60s. And then I ran into a <coughs> proposal that was written by some Europeans about six, seven years ago, and they 
wanted to revive this and they had this whole paper with all the calculations and you know this is what we could do with the bomb explosion of course is completely unfeasible but very interesting yeah so people are looking for this highly interesting uh, is And if you now go to Earth, one of the things that puzzles me is that the abundance of individual elements is uh, not uniform. It's, uh, there are places where there's more uh, iron, or more uranium, or uh, whatever. Uh, can you, do you have any explanation for why the distribution is so uneven on Earth? Yeah, I really no. I'm not a, maybe we have some geologists here in the audience. Um, so you mean the distribution of the Earth's crust? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. This is a good question. Yeah. Just extending the same question. Um, if the sun has such a low level of metallicity, why is it that the Earth has such a rich content of metals? Again, I'm not an expert in this, but if you think about how these things are born, if small bodies are born, you have the solar system, you have the central object, the sun, and then you have small objects, the gravity is pretty weak. So there's no free hydrogen in, on Earth because this has diffused away. The atmosphere of Mars is very thin because Mars doesn't have enough gravity to keep a substantial atmosphere. So yeah, it depends on the size of these objects that form. And then also, of course, the material out of which they form. Yeah. I don't know, this is partially answer. I'm just babbling here, yeah. Yep. Oh, you mentioned the formation of lithium, boron, and beryllium were by cosmic ray spallation. Could you just uh, explain a little bit about what that actually means, please? So what I talked about during this talk is what we call thermonuclear reactions. That means that you have a thermal equilibrium in the plasma that is defined by some temperature, and then the energy required for fusion to occur is the thermal energy, is the kinetic energy. You've got to put kinetic energy into the system before two nuclei can fuse, and this kinetic energy arrives from the heat. So th it's thermal energy. Now, cosmic ray spallation reaction is completely different. There's no thermalization going on there. You have cosmic rays. We don't know exactly where they're coming from. The best theories say maybe supernova explosions and then somehow part of the ejector are being re-accelerated. Very complicated models, but you have cosmic rays um, at ultra-relativistic energies consisting mostly of protons, helium, and a little bit of of heavy ions. So picture those, they're moving out through the interstellar medium. And there's a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in the interstellar medium. They will hit these through collisions. So these are not simple fusion reactions, but these are collisions at very high energy. So say an ultra relativistic proton will hit carbon and knock out one proton or two neutrons and so on. We call these spallation reactions. And People discovered early on that there's this very large dip in the abundance distribution, and then people didn't know what's happening. The reaction fusion cross-sections in stars involving beryllium boron are huge, meaning if you have any beryllium and boron there, stars will destroy that. And then people discovered the high abundance of beryllium boron in cosmic rays. That was the key to this discovery. Uh, sorry, in how the... Much, how much carbon is there in the interstellar medium per cubic kilometer? Oh, there's almost none. But we're not talking about cubic kilometer. We're talking about cubic light years. <laughs> this is the... I mean, yeah, out there there's very little, but you got you to gotta imagine the distances these cosmic rays travel. They travel through the galaxy. So the column density is substantial. And very simple calculations. I can show you afterwards they come out to about the right abundances for beryllium and boron. Yeah. 
But locally, of course, yeah, you have almost no chance of a reaction within one kilometer out there. But we're not talking about kilometers when we talk about space. Any more questions? Oh, I'll just thank uh, Christian once more. <laughs> and on behalf of uh, Maka, <laughs> wow. there's a nice bottle of wine from Victoria. Thank he you, Simon. Heathcote, which is uh, where the ASV dark site is. Thank you. The winery area. Oh. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Sure, it was my pleasure.